Hi students. In this video, I'd like to talk about some surprising or unexpected behavior in the ionization energy trend. Remember in the previous video, I talked about the general trend that we should be able to expect ionization energy to increase as we move up a group because the N value is decreasing, the atom is getting smaller, and as the atom gets smaller, the electrons are held tighter to the nucleus, and that requires a greater ionization energy to pull an electron away, according to rule one. And according to rule two, the ionization energy increases as we move to the right across a row, across a period. And that is because we are adding protons to the nucleus, and as we increase the number of protons in the nucleus, we are increasing the attractive force on those electrons, and therefore it requires greater ionization energy to pull an electron away. So this trend of ionization energy increasing as it goes up and to the right is exactly the reverse of the trend of atomic size, because atomic size, they get larger as you go left and down. Well, the surprises or the exceptions come in when rule two is overruled. And it's overruled by rule three, the valence subshell effects that we talked about in the previous video. So rule one always wins. That trend is always maintained. Ionization energy always increases as you go up a group. But the rule two can sometimes be overruled by effects due to the valence subshell electron configurations. And we're going to see how these valence subshell effects can sometimes overrule the general trend expected from rule two. So as it says here, because of electron configurations, factor three or rule three that we just talked about, the expected trend to increase ionization energy as we go across a period, across a row, is not always followed. There are exceptional cases here. So I'm going to tell you in example A that magnesium has a higher ionization energy than aluminum. So let's take a look at magnesium and aluminum. They are both in the N equals 3 row. So they both have the same valence level. And there's magnesium and there's aluminum. So according to rule 1, they are tied because their valence level for both of them is N equals 3. And so we go to rule 2 to determine which has the higher ionization energy. Now the general trend, the expected trend, is as you go to the right, you are adding protons, and so you would expect the IE to increase. But this problem is specifically saying that magnesium has a higher IE than aluminum. So it does not follow the expected trend. Magnesium has the higher IE instead of it increasing as we go across to aluminum. So why is that? Why is rule two being overruled? Why is the general trend not being followed? So I would like for you to look at the rule three that we discussed earlier and see if you can find something going on in rule three that would explain that anomaly. And as a reminder, here's rule three. The subrules are an electron in a higher subshell will be easier to pull away and therefore it has a lower IE. B, filled shells and subshells are more stable, so they have a higher IE. And C, paired electrons repel each other and therefore have lower IE. So see if you can find something in there that explains this anomaly where rule two the expected trend that we would increase IE going from magnesium to aluminum is overruled and instead it's magnesium with a higher IE. See if you can work that out and since this is rule three you're probably going to need to draw the electron diagrams for both of these and then take a look at that rule three and its sub rules and see if any one of those sub rules apply to this situation. Go ahead and pause the video now and when you're done, resume the video, and I'll work through the answer. Okay, coming back to this video, 
Let's look at example A again. And I'm telling you right away that magnesium has a higher IE than aluminum. And this violates the expected trend based on rule two that would say we would normally expect aluminum to have a higher IE than magnesium because of the extra proton in its nucleus. So if we know that this is an exception to rule two, let's take a look at rule three and see which of those might apply. And there is a note here. Note that this violates the expected trend based on factors one and two. Actually, it does not violate the trend based on factor one, but it does violate the factor based on two but it can be explained by electron configurations. So let's take a look at the electron configurations of magnesium and aluminum. So here's magnesium. Well, clearly I didn't leave myself much space here. So rather than trying to squeeze it all in right there, I'm just going to turn this to the side and in a future edit of this workbook, I'll give myself more space there to work. But for right now, I'll just draw the electron diagrams uh, vertically like this. So it gives me some vertical space. So I have magnesium and I have aluminum. And if I look at magnesium, magnesium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. So let's do that. And it goes all the way up to 3s2, so I'm going to fill up electrons all the way up to 3s2 and fill. And that's the electron diagram for magnesium right there. For aluminum, it adds an additional electron, so I'm going to draw those. Filling in those electrons. Pairing these up. And then here comes the extra electron for aluminum, and I think you can start to see what's going on. When aluminum pops that extra electron up in the higher energy subshell of the 3P, it is now going to be easier to remove an electron from aluminum because that it has an electron in the higher energy subshell the 3p compared to magnesium, which does not have an electron up there in the 3p. So if I want to remove an electron from the magnesium atom, I have to reach all the way down, energetically speaking, into the 3s subshell and break it apart and grab one of those electrons in the 3s subshell. However, if I want to remove an electron from aluminum, I don't have to reach that far down. There's an electron hanging out up here in a higher energy subshell that will be much easier to remove. So even though aluminum has an extra proton in it that is attracting all of its electrons a little bit tighter than for magnesium, aluminum has very helpfully placed an electron in the higher energy subshell, the 3p subshell. So even though all the electrons are being held a little bit tighter, it's got an electron hanging out in a significantly higher energy subshell that makes it easier to remove. So again, this is a violation of the expected trend that aluminum would have a higher ionization energy than magnesium. When in fact, because of that electron that's easier to remove, aluminum has a lower IE than magnesium. So which rule explains this? This is rule three, one of the exceptions that comes in rule three. And specifically, it is rule 3a. An electron in a higher subshell will be easier to pull away and therefore has a lower IE. So this is rule to explain this. Why does magnesium have a higher IE than aluminum? The answer is rule 3a gives us our reasoning. And it's aluminum's 3p electron right there. Okay? 
All right, we've got example problem B, and we're going to do the same thing. For example, problem B, I would like for you to pause the video, answer this question, and you'll probably have to draw the electron configurations the way I have to be able to answer this question. Go ahead and do that now, pause the video, and when you're finished, resume the video and I'll work through the answer. Okay, coming back to this question, why does nitrogen has a higher IE than oxygen? So nitrogen has a higher IE than oxygen. Well, let's take a look. According to the expected trend due to rule two, we would expect oxygen to have the higher IE because it has an additional proton. That's what rule two tells us generally. However, this problem is saying that no, contrary to that expected trend, it's nitrogen that has the higher ionization energy. So, how do we explain that exception? Let's take a look at their electron configurations. So I'm going to draw the electron configuration for nitrogen and for oxygen. And they both have electrons that go up to the 2p subshell. For oxygen. Put the orbitals in here. So I can compare them. Nitrogen has a total of seven electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oxygen has a total of eight electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So if we are comparing these two, nitrogen and oxygen, which subrule in rule three tells us what's going on? An electron in a higher subshell will be easier to pull away. Well, they both have electrons in the same highest subshell, 2p. So rule 3a doesn't help us. Let's take a look at rule 3b. Filled shells and subshells are more stable. Well, and neither of them has a filled 2p subshell. So it can't be that rule. So let's look at the third subrule here, 3C. Paired electrons repel each other, having a lower ionization energy. Remember that electrons that are in pairs are already repelling each other. And if they're already pushing each other away, then it's easier to remove one. So let's take a look. And in its highest energy subshell, the 2P subshell, Notice that nitrogen has no pairs, but oxygen has a pair. And what that means is that, that those two electrons in oxygen's 2p subshell that are paired up, they are already trying to repel each other and pushing each other away, and therefore it's easier to remove an electron from oxygen compared to nitrogen. So the general trend for rule two says that you would expect oxygen to be harder to remove an electron from because of its extra a proton attracting its electrons to it. But because of that pair right there, it's actually easier to remove an electron from oxygen instead. So it violates the trend, and the reason for that violated trend is rule 3C. Now, it may have occurred to you that these exceptions are going to follow patterns in the periodic table. For rule 3a, where we are adding an extra electron in a higher energy subshell, that pattern is followed every time we compare a group 2 to a group 13 atom. So it's going to be true for comparing beryllium to boron it's going to be true for magnesium to aluminum and so forth. So that is a, an exception to the general trend of rule two, but it happens in expected predictable places. Anytime we compare group two and group 13. So it happens anytime we compare groups two and 13. 
When you compare a group 2 and group 13 atom in this same row, they are going to violate the expected trend based on rule 2, and the violation is going to be explained by rule 3a. And there's a similar pattern for this other rule 3c exception, because every time you compare an atom in group 15 to group 16, you're going to be going from having three electrons in the P subshell to four electrons in the P subshell, and so you will be introducing your first paired set of electrons. And so every time you're comparing a group 15 to a group 16 in the same row, you will have this exceptional case. So let's review this real quick. The general trend, the expected trend in ionization energy as we go across a row is that the ionization energy increases. That's the general expected trend because of the additional protons that we're placing in the nucleus. However, there are two exceptions that crop up and they are predictable as we go across rows. Anytime we're comparing a group 2 with a group 13 atom, we are going to have an exception to that trend due to rule 3a. And anytime we are comparing a group 15 to a group 16 atom, then that's going to lead to an exception to rule 2, and that exception is going to be due to rule 3c. Okay, so now I have a practice problem for you, and this is going to be a little bit more challenging because it's going to con because it's going to combine all of the rules and all of the exceptions to be able to do this problem. So this says rank the following in increasing order of their first ionization energy. So increasing order means we start small and we get larger and larger and larger. So I've given you four different elements here. And the atoms of these elements will have different ionization energies based on our rules. Some of them will follow the rule 1, some of them will follow rule 2, and some of them might be an exception to rule 2 based on the two exceptions that we've talked about in rule 3. So I would like for you to pause the video and see if you can place them in order from smaller IE up to and increasing to larger IE. This is a little bit of a logic puzzle, so go through the rules systematically. Apply rule 1 and then rule 2 and see if there are any exceptions to rule 2. All right, go ahead and pause the video and do that. And when you're done, resume and I will work through the answers for you. All right, coming back to this practice problem, we have four atoms. And we need to arrange them in increasing order of their ionization energies. So let's take a look at rule one. So nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. And here they all are. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Well, right there, you can see that one of these atoms is in a different row. One of these atoms, chlorine, has a higher N value for its valence level than the others. What does that mean? The trend for rule one says that you increase ionization energy as you go up the periodic table. So that tells us that every atom in this row is going to have a higher ionization energy than chlorine. So chlorine must be our lowest ionization energy according to rule one, and rule one never has any exceptions. So chlorine is the lowest, i.e., and therefore chlorine comes first. Chlorine comes first and it has the lowest IE due to rule one, right? And then what comes next? So that's, this, that's the lowest and so it comes first and the others get greater and greater and greater. So what's greater than chlorine? Now let's go to rule two. And rule two says the general trend is, as we go right across a period, the ionization energy increases and increases and increases. So I would expect the trend to be, 
increasing as we go from nitrogen to oxygen and to fluorine. So I could write N, O, and F. However, I know that there are exceptions. Anytime I'm comparing a group 2 to 13, or if I'm comparing a group 15 to 16, I violate the rule 2 trend. And right there, I know that N and O are groups 15 and 16, and that violates the trend. So rather than going in increasing order, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, it's going to be, these two are going to be flipped. And it's going to be oxygen, and then nitrogen is higher, and then fluorine. So oxygen, and then nitrogen, and then fluorine. Now we know that fluorine is the largest IE because of rule two. Because it has the most protons of the three in that row, and it is not one of our exceptional cases. And so why did oxygen have a lower IE than nitrogen? This is a rule 3C exception to rule 2. Okay, so let me walk through that again. We had four atoms. Three of them were in the same row, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and chlorine was in the next row. Because chlorine was in a different row, I could differentiate chlorine right away in terms of its ionization energy. Because according to rule one, the valence level determines whether you have a higher or lower IE. And as you go up the periodic table, it gets higher. And that rule never has an exception. That's rule one. As a result, I knew that chlorine had to be the lowest ionization energy of all of them. So I put it first. The other three could be differentiated according to rule two because they're all in the same row. So I know that it, rule two says that as you go rightward across the row, you get larger and larger and larger IE. So fluorine must have the largest IE. And then I recognized that the nitrogen and oxygen are in an exceptional case, and so I had to flip them. So it was oxygen and then nitrogen and then fluorine. So those are the exceptions to the general trend stipulated by rule two for the increase in ionization energy as you move rightward across a period.